that if I record a lot of audio with my band, uh, we can collaboratively organize these uh, long audio files into smaller segments, which we can then uh, sort of start to form into coherent ideas. Um, so yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. Um, what happens when you put your... There we go. Alright, so before we talk about what we're going to talk about, we wanted to keep this presentation a little bit more low level, because our project kind of has a larger scope than, uh, say, the, no the mobile notifier application. So a lot of what we did was very uh, back-end, a lot of back-end work, which is kind of difficult to demonstrate. So um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is prefaced on the fact that you guys understand what the model view controller, or uh, also this kind of derivation off of it, the model view template paradigm is all about. So I'm going to explain that real quick. Um, basically, what model view template is all about is uh, it takes what would be a traditional web app uh, architecture and abstracts away the relational database that usually gets thrown into the mix. So instead of writing SQL like this all over the place, you, uh, you can replace it with classes which uh, sort of map object-oriented notation to relational databases and make interfacing with that uh, data a lot easier. Um, so another part of it, so that was the model. The template is um, a generic way to represent your data. So it's pretty much, in, a, in the case of Django, um, uh, markup littered with these uh, generic variables everywhere that then get replaced by next slide, uh, the view. So your browser is directly interfacing with view functions. You call some URL which calls this function. The function then queries the model without using any SQL, which is the nice part and then renders a template with the information that it got from this model query. So in this case, we found a message, the mess we found all messages that start with the word awesome, and then rendered that template before back to the browser. So it's just a uh, sort of like compact way to architect a web app without having to think about a lot of the back-end on All right, so um, some of the things that I worked on, and then in the interest of time, I'm only really going to go into detail on the model reconstruction we did. Um, concert was an established application before we started bringing it to Arcos, so there was a lot of really, uh, there was a lot of code that, that existed before this uh, this semester, and it was kind of Colin and I and a couple other kids from SDND learning Django when we first built this, so there was a lot of bad practices all over the place. Um, if you guys want to know more about what this is about, uh, replacing custom views with Django provided defaults and uh, some of the custom template variables we wrote, we're going to have a blog post up, but like I said, we'll just go on to you the model reconstruction. So I described before what the model view template, how that kind of works, and uh, naively when we first started designing this, um, the, what we did was put a lot of the functionality into the views. So uh, that is sort of, uh, what, it's a way to do things, but when you do things like that, you end up coupling the hell out of your application. There's repeated code all over the place. So next slide. Um, this is one of the views that existed in concert before this semester. It is how we tag segments. So as Colin said before, we have this idea of a segment, and each segment can get organized into different tags. So what this is doing is it's, um, it's getting the segment that you want to tag. It's looking at the tag name that you provided already exists. If not, it creates the tag. If the name for, this, for the tag is invalid, it, uh, it, it throws an exception. There's a lot of logic in here. It's not so much it's important to understand what this is doing other than that it's doing a lot. So we replace that with this. Um, we get the segment, and then we wrote on the model side uh, pretty much member functions that do that encapsulate all this logic. So next slide. This is a segment from uh, our current model, which defines an audio segment, its member variables, and then we started throwing in a bunch of uh, member uh, functions too to encapsulate a lot of this repeated <coughs> logic that was all over the place. So these are, we wrote several of them to, uh, to, to kind of, like I said, do exactly that. Um, next slide. So the other thing that I worked on was an event system. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of objects that get created in concert all over the place, like tags, segments, um, audio objects can get uploaded to the system. And we wanted to have something similar to Facebook notifications that would allow uh, users that log into the system to see what happened on the system since they've last been logged in. So, Next slide. Um, we created this uh, generic superclass called an event, which keeps track of some uh, basic information about an event. 
basically the time that the event occurred uh, and the collection of audio that this event was relevant to. And off of this superclass, excellent, we created uh, a slew of subclasses that correspond to all the different things that can happen within our system. What's nice about this is uh, if you wanted to handle all this by hand, then you would have to instantiate one of these events every time you instantiated a tag, you would have to do a tag created event, so on and so forth. But the way that we wrote it, we tied all the event creation into the uh, more generic object creation. So every time you create a tag, every time you create a tag, a tag created event gets thrown automatically. Every time you delete a tag, the tag created events in the system that correspond to that tag get <coughs> deactivated in a sense. So. Um, everything happens automatically, which makes view writing, the, the majority of the work that we have to do, uh, still um, much, much simpler. So, that I handed it. So, yeah, sort of this uh, recurring theme of like what he just said about the stuff that we have to do in the future is going to be a lot more simple. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like this uh, curve of like, you know, the rate of functionality that's being implemented. So, um, the stuff that I worked on is a lot of client side stuff. Um, I'm really into like client side web development. And uh, so, just really quick, I'm going to go over these things in like one sentence. And like, all this is going to be written about in uh, this blog post that I'll, we'll post later on today. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, making a lot of things modular, like, for example, a loading notification on a panel with user interface doesn't need to be implemented for every single panel, right? It should just be implemented once and called from subclasses of panel. Um, CSS3 has this cool thing called box model layout, which is really awesome, uh, if anyone hasn't looked into that. Um, you know, some class documentation, uh, you know, making our documentation conform to the standards so that we can generate the um, HTML documentation pages that you can browse. Um, some functionality. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is this framework called Backbone.js that's uh, gained a lot of, like, uh, popularity. Uh, in recent times, and uh, it's really awesome. So go ahead. Uh, so yeah, it's MIT. Um, it is uh, sort of can be thought about as like an MVC framework for the client side code, but it's a little strange to think about it like that in the same context as you would typically think about model view controller frameworks. Um, but it also uh, includes this ORM like model interface. Sorry if you don't know what an ORM is, but basically it allows you to, uh, when you have a relational database, it allows you to use object-oriented uh, models instead of like calling SQL. Right? Um, and then it also really well uh, abstracts away any sort of inter interaction with uh, the DOM and the data that you're representing on the DOM. So uh, I'll go into these in a bit more detail. So this is the ORM-like interface, right? So in an ORM, if you were uh, talking about a database, right, this dot save method would be abstracting away the actual SQL that you're sending to the database. But in Backbone, what it's doing is it's abstracting away the interaction with the server. So all I have to do is hit book.save in JavaScript, and it'll know what Ajax call to make to the server. And then the server can handle that on its side. Um, so obviously it makes things a lot quicker and uh, faster. So um, the next thing was this separation from the DOM and the data. So the DOM, um, if anyone doesn't know, is sort of the uh, model which you represent your user interface uh, in HTML. Document object model. Yes, the document object model. So the idea is that if you have different areas where the same data is going to be represented. So say I have some data, like a collection of, um, uh, a collection in our application is this group of users and audio objects that uh, people can collaborate on, right? That's good. Um, so say we have a set of collections, right? So that's how we would instantiate it. So that's the name of the collection, that's the amount of users, right? And then we have two areas in our uh, interface where the same data needs to be represented, right? So um, in this case, this is the Manage Collections panel. So on this certain page, you can manage your collections and you can delete them and things like that. So that's the, it shows the name, the amount of users. And it also needs to be shown here um, in this dropdown 
that allows the user to sort of select which collection they want to go into to like start organizing, right? So um, if I add a new collection, go ahead, uh, like this, right? So I just have this user collections object and I add. Using Backbone, since both of these uh, views, as they call them, are watching this same set of data, um, because this data set was changed, the render method of both of these views will be called, and then go ahead, uh, uh, yeah, and then see that uh, the views will be updated with the new set of data. So you don't need to worry about when you change data and where it exists on your interface and like go around to all the different places that it's, that it's existing and change the uh, how it's displayed, right? It abstracts all that away for you. Um, so, good. Yeah, so it's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, we're working on the future is, uh, you know, just continuing to set up this framework and uh, getting things running. Uh, this is a mock-up. It's hard to see on the projector, but uh, that uh, designer did for us. We're going to continue with the iterations of the design to get something that we're happy with. Um, yep, that's pretty much it. So that's, that's our progress. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to Morthy and to Sean for, you know, the same old reasons that everyone keeps repeating, but definitely obligatory and uh, appreciated. Yeah. I'm the Peter for the, for the good. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions? I know it's hard to get people. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, a lot of the work that you did this semester was back-end stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I've checked out your source screen. It goes all the way back to, like, March of this year. Like, it's a pretty, yeah. it, it has yeah. a, a long history. So would you categorize a lot of the work that you did this semester um, as like a lot of scaffolding and then some building on top of that to make Concert like a really powerful web application? So originally, the, the beginning of the semester, we really wanted to work on interface, right? Because the, the app was somewhat established at the beginning of the semester, but the interface wasn't. Um, but having had taken a semester off from looking at the source, once we finally started to delve into that, we realized that a lot of the ways we went around writing the code were just completely not scalable. Uh, in other words, any functionality that was going to be modified or added thereafter would take 10 times longer than if it was written in the way that we uh, have rewritten it up until this point. So in a sense, yeah, we were kind of, we kind of <coughs> took everything down and scaffolded it all back up to build kind of a foundation for something that would be maintainable in the future. So the, the, the logic is all there at this point, and we're kind of back where we were at the beginning of the semester, except now it's actually doable to start doing an interface. I think someone over here had a question uh, first. I think I answered myself and uh, Jeff. So it's in Python, probably not a big concern, but I'm just curious, you do all this abstraction and everything. Uh, has it been a problem for performance at all with all these layers or not really noticeable? So like um, the, the server, it doesn't really do that much work. Yeah. So it's just it's negligible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. The only time it does some effort is when it's like encoding audio. But then it's not Python work. Right, that's that's done. Okay. <laughs> so, <coughs> what did Chris do? Chris was supposed to be, he was recruited to do the user interface, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, Chris yeah, so isn't he, here right now. He so. developed some mock ups. Um, he, he did this design. Um, but, you know. It's, okay, that's fine. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Just working there. Yeah, I, I thought when Chris came in the first talk or so, he, was, he mentioned about the user interface thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks.